Chapter six of Around the Campfire by Charles Roberts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six The Camp on Squatook River. Part two An Adventure with a Bull Moose. I don't know much about the lumber camps, but I got this from a Restigouche lumberman, so of course it must be true. One day a woodsman, who had been on a long tramp prospecting for prime birch timber, rushed into a camp on the Restigouche with news that he had discovered a yard of moose. A yard, it may here be explained, is an opening in the forest where a herd of moose has trampled down the snow and made its headquarters. The yard is always surrounded by young trees, upon whose succulent shoots the moose feed it forms a striking scene the animals lying about the space of trampled and discolored snow while here and there a magnificently antlered bull towers above the rest keeping watch and here and there on the edge of the yard an animal is reaching aloft its long prehensile lips to tear down its meal of green branches now the news which the inspector brought into camp created an instant interest fresh meat was at a premium in the restigouche camp and at the thought of moose meat which is a sort of beef idealized every lumberman's mouth began to water longingly the boss was quite at one with the hands in this respect wherefore it was not long before a hunt was organized only those men could take part who had snowshoes for the snow was deep that season so there was a small muster of five but with those five went the blessings of the camp upon their success hung the hopes of all their hungry comrades the wind fortunately for the hunters was blowing from the yard to the camp so that it was not necessary to take a roundabout course the expedition was led by the prospector who was an enthusiastic hunter and skilled in woodcraft it was past midday as the yard was approached the hunters separated and closed in on the yard from all sides save that from which the wind was directly blowing the leader whose name was story had the longest way to go in order that by the time he could get into position all the others might be ready and waiting presently an owl was heard to hoot twice this was story's signal the moose heard it too and pricked up their ears for the owls they were accustomed to hear hooted as a rule in the night time then they heard the soft hurried tramping of the snowshoes and the crackling of frosted twigs all about them and huddled together terrified in the middle of their yard the next moment five rifles blazed out upon them and the hunters rushed in two of the creatures fell at the volley and two more fat young cows were knifed by the nimble huntsman and the rest of the herd dashed wildly off running up the wind where they scented no danger now story was in a great disgust his shot had failed to kill he had fired at the chief of the herd a splendid bull whose antlers he craved as a trophy the bull was struck somewhere in the body for he staggered but instantly recovering he had charged fiercely in the direction of the assault story had stepped behind a tree and the mad beast not detecting him had continued his career through the woods almost at right angles to the direction which was taken by the rest of the herd story gave chase at a run loading as he went the bull was already out of sight but his track was ample guide the hunter knew he had hit the animal hard and looked for a speedy triumph for an hour he continued his long trot encouraged from time to time by the sight of blood upon the snow the animal's path led at last through a region of gullies and copses and low broad beech trees suddenly as story was skirting the crest of a little ravine from a thicket close ahead of him the great moose dashed out with a bellow and charged upon him like lightning the hunter had not time to check himself but whipped the gun to his shoulder and took a snapshot even at the same instant the snow gave way beneath his feet and his shot flew wide as he rolled to the foot of the ravine the animal was upon him before he could recover himself and he thought his end was come dropping his gun now useless he drew his knife and just escaping one keen prong he seized the antlers with one hand while with the other he slashed at the animal's neck it was the depth and softness of the snow with the confusion of bushes and roots beneath it that saved him from being crushed at once 
as the moose felt the knife at his neck he drew back and threw up his head with violence intending to trample his adversary with his terrible hoofs but the neck of the moose has tremendous power and as the hunter clung to his hold with desperate tenacity knowing that his last chance depended on it he was thrown high into the air he came in contact violently with a beech tree branch one thinks quickly in such emergencies as these or rather an instinct drowsy at other times wakes up and saves us the need of thought story flung both his arms around the branch and with a great sigh of thankfulness and possibly an inward utterance of the same swung himself out of harm's way when his opponent failed to fall the moose was astonished he turned round and round and tore up the snow and bellowed hoarsely in his rage the thing was inexplicable at last he looked upward and saw the hunter in the branches his indignation waxed fiercer than ever and he made desperate efforts to pull down the branches by seizing and breaking off their tips how the huntsman chuckled and derided him after a time the mad brute grew more calm then to story's supreme disgust he lay down under the tree to starve his prisoner out the hunter had no gun the weather was severe there was nothing to eat there was no way of stealing off unobserved to crown all the wretched man recalled a number of incidents showing the implacable persistence of the wounded bulls of this species for perhaps an hour the hunter waited vainly hoping that this particular moose would prove less obstinate than his kind or would get homesick for the rest of the herd or would die of his inward wound but nothing seemed farther from the animal's intention than any one of these things it was growing dark and the shivering captive began to realize that he would have to spend the night in his tree he tucked his knife back safely in its sheath and undertook to warm himself a little his snowshoes he had taken off long before and had tied them to a limb knowing that if they should fall to the ground the moose would at once make mincemeat of them then he proceeded to climb about the tree with the utmost energy and agility while the moose who had risen promptly to his feet looked on with the utmost obvious amazement by this means story soon got rid of his chill before it was quite dark he selected a safe and comparatively comfortable spot where two large branches forked and tying himself securely to the limb with his long scarf he tried to go to sleep it was a profitless undertaking and after an hour or two of faithful effort he gave it up he was stiff miserable hungry and half frozen it had grown so dark that he thought perhaps he might descend the other side of the tree and slip away without the moose being any the wiser with what he fancied perfect noiselessness he tried it he was almost down when there was a bellow and a rush and the animal was almost upon him he escaped just by a hair's breadth and swung nimbly back into his refuge he had no stomach for another attempt of that sort he began to calculate how long it would be before they would miss him in camp and come to look for him the prospect did not cheer him known as he was for a determined hunter his comrades would go home without him confident that he would turn up all right when he had bagged his game if he was not back by morning they would perhaps think something had gone wrong and set out to look for him they would have to retrace their steps to the moose yard and then picking up his trail from the yard might be expected to rescue him about noon by that time he thought to himself miserably he might be frozen stiff he decided to do something but what at first he thought of cutting a branch fastening his knife to the end of it and stabbing his captor with the improvised harpoon but the beech branches were too thick and crooked to suit his idea he did at last however succeed in splicing a sort of spear about five feet long and when he had got the knife lashed to the end of it all his stock of twine was exhausted the spear was pretty satisfactory but he of course dared not throw it and the moose showed no inclination to come where he could be effectually and neatly dispatched the hunter struck his harpoon into a limb and set out to concoct another weapon by this time the moon was up the hunter tore a little strip from his shirt 
wet it in his mouth and rubbed it full of gunpowder this made a fair bit of slow match which he folded several times longitudinally and then inserted in the top of his powder flask to the short end which he left protruding he touched a match and then he tossed the flask down in front of the moose the sputtering of the slow match for a moment disconcerted the animal and he drew back then as if ashamed of his weakness he sprang upon the flask and trampled it fiercely under his feet while he was indulging in this interesting performance the powder exploded with a bang and the astounded animal sprang high into the air but though badly startled he was not frightened by any means he was shocked and scorched and a little torn at the forelegs but this only made him the more deadly in a paroxysm of pain and hatred he dashed under the tree and rearing frantically struggled to reach the hunter this was just what the wily woodsman desired lying flat on a branch almost within reach of the beast's antlers he reached down and dealt him a blow in the neck a second thrust went deeper and struck a more vital part almost under the throat the blood gushed out in a torrent and the hunter congratulated himself that deliverance was near at hand presently the great animal stood still and looked about him with a puzzled anxious air he felt his strength going from him and could not understand it soon he began to sway from side to side and had to brace his feet apart to keep from falling at last he fell then the hunter stretching himself came down out of the tree and stood beside his noble and defeated antagonist story was too weak and cold and hungry to think of waiting to cut off the animal's head and hide it from the bears he slipped on his snowshoes found his gun and started back in haste for the camp before daylight he had reached the yard and there to his intense delight he met a party of his comrades who had set out in the night to look for him dan and now said i i'll tell you of dan's great fight it was fought before he came into my possession that is before my friend h going away to study in germany handed him over to me it was just a few weeks before h s departure and we were setting out for a farewell trip to the wilderness together as for dan he was not much to look at certainly and i was prejudiced against him by the fact that he took up room in the canoe to carry a great bulldog in a birch canoe was contrary to all my notions of the fitness of things but h had protested so vehemently against the idea of leaving him behind and the dog had behaved with such sobriety and good sense when i took him out to try him in a choppy sea that i yielded a reluctant consent our proposed route was through the chain of the chaputnetikuk lakes downstream all the way with no difficult water to contend against and no bad rapids to shoot we had two canoes that which bore h and myself and that in which our indian carried the baggage so that really it was not impossible to make room for the addition to our party and dan was formally enrolled a member he took his place in the forward midsection of my canoe immediately behind his master where he coiled himself up into a compact bundle there he calmly ignored the wildest vagaries to which the lake waves could impel our little craft this good seamanship of his with his dignified manner toward myself and his adoring devotion to his master gradually won my respect and before we had been many days out we were on terms of mutual consideration i ended with a cordial enjoyment of his company i think i began by declaring that dan was not much to look at this was my first and biased impression but it must be modified by the acknowledgment that his splendid proportions and great strength were apparent to the most casual observer in fact he was a perfect specimen of his breed but the expression of his small eye and mighty jaw which certainly belied his true character was bloodthirsty to the last degree and his white coat was disfigured with a tangle of long scars which looked as if the business of his life were brawls as i afterwards learned those scars were the ornament of a hero no less to be honored than if his great heart had throbbed in a human body it was one night in camp at the head of the big chupunukakuk that i heard how those scars were achieved 
tent was pitched on a bit of dry interval which fringed the base of a high rock a well-known landmark to trappers and distinguished by the name of the devil's pulpit the rock towered over us naked and perpendicular for a distance of two hundred feet then shelved and rose again some hundreds of feet farther to a beetling cap of mingled rock and forest our camp was flanked on each side by a thicket of cherry and vines and young water ash and the light of our fire filled the space between with the comfort of its cheerful radiance in the midst of this we lay basking each waiting for the other to begin a yarn but no one seemed prepared we had been out ten days in the wilderness and night after night our occupation had been this one of swapping experiences till i had found myself compelled to fall back on my inventive faculty and our indian steve who was communicative beyond the custom of his people had begun to repeat himself in his stories as for h he never spun a yarn save under some strong compulsion yet we knew more or less vaguely that many a strange experience had fallen to his lot we had had some stirring adventures together he and i since first i had initiated him into the mysteries of woodcraft but it was rare for him to recall them in conversation and hence i judged that there was much in his experience of which i had never heard on the present occasion the long silence was becoming almost drowsy for me the flame from our logs was beginning to change mistily into the glow from a heaped-up grate and to play over two small curly heads and a long-eared pup on a hearth-rug when suddenly from far up in the moonlit rocks of the summit came the wail of the northern panther i was startled wide awake and the little vision faded instantly into a consciousness of the open heaven the white lake and that lonely haunted summit but it was not altogether the panther that had startled me it was dan who had sprung almost over my head toward the hillside and now stood trembling with wrath at the command of his master he stalked back and sat down again but he faced the hillside and never withdrew his fierce gaze from the spot whence the sound had seemed to come never mind him old dog said h soothingly you can't get at him you know what makes dan so excited i asked i never saw him so much worked up before see he's fairly quivering oh replied h there's no love lost between dan and the indian devils that yelling stirs up some lively reminiscences in his old pate he thinks that indian devil is coming right down here to tackle me see how he keeps me in his eye and see him turn his muzzle round now and then to lick those scars of his i'll venture to say he feels them smart now when he remembers the night he got them at the head of the little tobique let's have it old man i urged you've never told me about that scrape i've been taking those scars as a certificate of dan's fighting propensities do you suppose any dog said h in a tone of disdain could carve dan up in that style not by a good deal it was a big indian devil that undertook the contract he accomplished the frescoing in a very elaborate fashion as you see but he didn't survive the job h compressed his lips and added i can tell you my dear boy that was something like an indian devil that fellow and came mighty near settling my claims for me he measured six feet from tip of nose to tip of tail and you know what a poor sort of thing they all have for a tail it was dan saved my life that night pete and i settled ourselves more comfortably against our log cushions dan having heard no more yells from the hilltop and having perceived that the conversation concerned himself curled himself up with a gratified air and thrust his great head into his master's lap you remember resumed h last year i went to the tobique all by myself except for dan's company i was gone six weeks and more when i got back to fredericton you were off up quebec way and so i never happened to tell you about the trip well i had the best fishing you can conceive of it was far better than any we've ever had together in those streams but as for the panthers i never heard anything like them they used to howl round the woods at night in a frightful way dan used to keep awake all night watching for them but they never ventured near the camp they didn't disturb me but if i had not had dan with me i might have felt a little shaky perhaps at night i had rather a contempt for the brutes at that time but they were not much help to a fellow when he was feeling lonely 
you know that pretty cove on the right shore of the little tobique about a hundred yards from where the brook flows in on that patch of open just on top of the bank i pitched my tent by the time the camp was fixed and the fish fried for supper it was getting pretty well past sundown it was a gorgeous moonlit night as bright as day there wasn't a mosquito about i tell you i felt pretty nice as i lifted the pink flakes of fried trout onto my plate and fixed a dish for dan i was getting out the hard tack when i saw a whopping big trout jump just by the mouth of the brook it was bigger than any i had caught so far and i could not bear to lose the chance of taking him while he was feeding i set down my plate telling dan to watch it seized my rod tied on a cast of white and gray millers and struck hurriedly through the bushes toward the other side of the cove where i thought i could get a fair cast you know what sort of a place that shore is all banks and boulders and thickets and little gullies and some of those gullies are hidden by fallen trees or grown over with weeds and vines you have to keep your eyes open or you are liable to tumble into these pitfalls i was in a hurry and plunged right ahead i wanted to catch that trout and get back to my supper at last about sixty or seventy yards from the camp i dodged round a thick fir bush and saw right in front of me something that brought me up mighty short i can tell you not ten feet away crouched along the top of a white boulder lay a huge indian devil just ready to spring i felt queer right down to my boots but kept my eyes fixed on those of the brute which gleamed like two emeralds in the moonlight my right hand reached for my belt and i stealthily drew my old sheath knife at the same time i whistled sharply for dan the brute was on the very point of springing when i whistled but the shrill sound startled him and deterred him for a moment he glanced uneasily from side to side half rising then he drew himself together again for his spring before he could launch himself forth i hurled the butt of my fishing rod full in his face and sprang aside i saw the long body flash toward me and at the same instant i crashed through a tangle of underbrush and sank into one of those gullies instinctively i threw out my left arm to save myself my grasp caught a tree root on the edge of the hole the next instant i felt the panther's teeth sink into my arm i didn't know how deep that hole was but i wanted to be at the bottom of it right away at the risk of stabbing myself i slashed desperately above my head with my free right hand it was not a breath too soon for at that very instant the brute had reached down with the amiable intention of clawing my head the knife went through his paw which he snatched back snarling fiercely but he kept his grip on my arm then i heard dan come tearing through the brush i lunged again blindly of course and this time the blade went through the panther's jaw and into my own flesh the brute let go and i rolled to the foot of the gully a distance of some five or six feet even as i fell i heard dan's vindictive cough as he sank his teeth into his adversary's throat there was a mad snarl from the big cat a struggle and the two rolled down on top of me i got out of the way in a great hurry at first it was too dark down there to distinguish the combatants in a moment however my eyes got used to the gloom the two animals were almost inextricably mixed up dan's grip was right under the panther's jaw so that he could not make any use of his teeth the wary old dog had drawn himself up into a tight ball so as to expose as little of himself as possible to the attack of his enemy's claws but his back and haunches were getting terribly mangled dan fought in silence but the indian devil made noise enough for both and the yelling down in that little hole was fiendish i felt my left arm and found it was not broken then i sprang on the indian devil seized him by the tail and tried to jerk his hind legs clear of dan his back was bowed up into a half circle and there was no unbending that arch of steel i dug the knife twice into his side and he paid no attention to it so absorbed was he in the life and death struggle with dan if left to themselves i saw that the fight would end with the death of both dan was inexorably working through the throat of his foe but was in a fair way to be torn to pieces before he could get this accomplished i threw myself on the panther's hindquarters twining my left arm round his supple loins and with my right hand i reached for his heart see the length of this blade 
i drove it into the hilt three times behind that brute's foreshoulder before i fetched him then he straightened out and fell over it was some time before i could persuade dan to drop him the poor old fellow was so torn he could hardly walk i picked him up in my arms though it's no joke to carry a dog of his weight and lugged him back to the camp we were a sight to see when we got there a mass of blood from head to foot i stayed at that camp four days nursing dan and myself before we were able to start for home and then we had to go for fear we'd be starved out i thanked my stars and your old-time injunctions that i had taken the little medicine case along with me it might have gone hard with us but for that as h concluded pete grunted in astonishment and admiration indeed these expressive grunts of his had furnished a running fire of comment throughout the narrative for myself i fetched a deep breath got up and went over to embrace dan as i rose i cast my eyes up the mountain and exclaimed talk of angels and you'll see their wings eh? Huh? look here h and pete followed my gaze far up in the whiteness of the moonlight we saw a stealthy form creep across the surface of bare rock dan saw it too and every muscle became rigid the form disappeared in a thick covert and a moment later there issued again upon the stillness that strange blood-curdling cry it sounded like a challenge to the hero of h's story but the challenge went unheeded h ordered dan into the tent in a few minutes we were wrapped in our blankets and the panthers had the wilderness all to themselves what became of dan at last inquired sam poisoned three years ago but i made the brutes that did it smart for it said i shutting my teeth with a snap hanging would have been none too good for them growled stranion from this the talk wandered to dogs in general and each man of course sang the praises of his own till presently stranion cried douse the glim and we rolled into our blankets end of chapter six part two chapter seven of around the campfire by charles roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven the camp on the toledi part one in the morning we set out at a reasonable hour planning to camp that night at the foot of toledi lake the last few miles of the squatook river were easy paddling save that here and there a fallen tree was in the way in passing these obstructions stranion proved unlucky his canoe led the procession with himself standing erect alert pole in hand in the stern while queerman sat lazily in the bow at length we saw ahead of us a tree trunk stretching across the channel by ducking our heads down to the gunwales there was room to pass under it but stranion tried a piece of gymnastics like a circus rider jumping through a hoop he attempted to step over the trunk while the canoe was passing under it in this he partly succeeded he got one foot over according to calculation and landed it safely in the canoe but as for the other well a malicious little projecting branch took hold of it by the moccasin and held on with the innate pertinacity of inanimate objects the canoe wouldn't wait so stranion remained behind with his captive foot he dropped head first into the water whence we rescued him the next time we came to an obstruction of this kind stranion didn't try to step over it he stooped to go under it but another malicious branch now came to the front the branch was long strong and sharp it reached down seized the back of stranion's shirt and almost dragged him out of the canoe failing in this for stranion's blood was up it ripped the shirt open and ploughed a long red furrow down his back it took an ocean of glycerin and arnica to assuage that wound on the upper toledi we found a brisk wind blowing hoisting improvised sails we sped down the lake without labor on the lower lake the two sheets of water are separated only by a short thoroughfare the wind failed us and we had to resume our paddling it was late in a golden hazy afternoon when we drew near the outlet here we overhauled an ancient indian who had been visiting his traps up the lake we recognized him as one old martin a well-known hunter and trapper 
he was plying his paddle with philosophic deliberation in the stern of the most dilapidated old canoe i have ever seen afloat his salutation to us was a grunt but when we invited him to camp near us and have a bit of supper with us he quickly became more civil round the campfire that night with a good supper comforting his stomach old martin forgot the red man's taciturnity sam was busy frying tobacco while the rest of us lounged about in the glow testing the results of these culinary experiments it will be remembered that when the upset took place at squatook falls our tobacco was almost all shut up in a certain tin box which we fondly fancied to be waterproof when the little store in the other canoes was exhausted we turned to this tin box alas that box was just so far waterproof as to let in the water and keep it from running out we found a truly delectable mess inside sam had undertaken to dry this mess out of which all the benign quality was pretty well steeped he pressed it therefore and rolled it tenderly and spread it out in the frying-pan over a gentle fire until it was quite dry but oh it was not good to smoke keeping a little to trifle with we bestowed all the rest of it upon the poor indian whose untutored mind led him to accept it gratefully perchance he threw it away when our backs were turned suddenly sam's task was interrupted by a wailing desolate and terrible cry coming apparently from the shores of the upper lake we gazed at each other with wide eyes and instinctively drew nearer the fire while sam cried out ugh what's that it must be cerberus himself got loose old martin grunted glooskap's hunting dog big storm by and by maybe he looked odd but not afraid he said it would not come near us it was heard sometimes in the night and far off as now but no man of the present day had ever seen the dog it ranged up and down throughout these regions howling for its master whom now it would never find for glooskap had been struck down in a deep valley north of the st lawrence and a mountain placed upon him so that neither could he stir nor anybody find him so martin explained that grim sound we learned afterwards that the cry was one of the rarer utterances of the loon but had any one told us so that night we would not have believed him we preferred to accept the weird notion of the faithful phantom hound seeking forever his vanished master the beneficent indian demigod about the time supper was done the weather had changed while sam was frying his tobacco the soft summery sweetness fled from the air and a cold wind set in blowing down out of the north it was a strange and unseasonable wind and pierced our bones we heaped the campfire to a threefold height and huddled in our blankets between the blaze and the lee of the tent then stranion was called on for a story tracked by a panther boys said he the air bites shrewdly it is a nipping and an eager air in fact it puts me forcibly in mind of one of my best adventures which befell me that winter when i was trapping on the little southwest miramichi oh come tell us a good summer story old man interrupted queerman i'm half frozen as it is to-night tell us about some place down in the tropics where they have to cool their porridge with boiling water nay replied stanion my thoughts are wintry and even so must my story be he traced in the air a few meditative circles with his pipe which he rarely smoked using it rather for oratorical effect and then resumed that was a hard winter of mine on the little sou'west i enjoyed it at the time and it did me good but looking back upon it now i wonder what induced me to undertake it i got the experience and i indulged my hobby to the full but by spring i felt like a barbarian it is a fine thing boys as we all agree to be an amateur woodsman and it brings a fellow very close to nature but it is much more sport in summer than in winter and it's better when one has good company than when he's no one to talk to but a preternaturally gloomy malecite i had noel with me that winter a good hunter and true but about as companionable as a mud turtle our traps were set in two great circuits one on the south side of the stream the other on the north the range to the north was in my own charge and a very big charge it was 
when i had any sort of luck it used to take me a day and a half to make the round for i had seventeen traps to tend spread out over a range of about twenty miles but when the traps were not well filled i used to do it without sleeping away from camp it's not much like play i can tell you tramping all day on snowshoes through those woods carrying an axe a fowling piece food ammunition and sometimes a pack of furs whenever i had to sleep out i would dig a big oblong hole in the snow build a roaring fire at one end of the hole bury myself in hemlock boughs at the other end and snooze like a dormouse till morning i relied implicitly on the fire to keep off any bears or indian devils that might be feeling inquisitive as to whether i would be good eating the snow must have been fully six feet deep that year one morning near the last of february i had set out my round and had made some three miles from our shanty when i caught sight of a covey of partridges in the distance and turned out of my way to get a shot at them it had occurred to me that perchance a brace of them might make savoury morsels for my supper after a considerable detour i bagged my birds and recovered my trail near the last trap i had visited my tracks as i had left them had been solitary enough but now i found they were accompanied by the footprints of a large indian devil i didn't really expect to get a shot at the beast but i loaded both barrels with ball cartridges as i went on however it began to strike me as strange that the brute should happen to be going so far in my direction step for step his footprints clung to mine when i reached the place where i had branched off in search of the partridges i found that the panther had branched off with me so polite a conformity of his ways to mine could have but one significance i was being tracked the idea when it first struck me struck me with too much force to be agreeable it was a very unusual proceeding on the part of an indian devil displaying a most imperfect conception of the fitness of things that i should hunt him was proper and customary but that he should think of hunting me was presumptuous and most unpleasant i resolved that he should be made to repent it before night the traps were unusually successful that trip and at last i had to stop and make a cache of my spoils this unusual delay seemed to mislead my wily pursuer who suddenly came out of a thicket while i was hidden behind a tree trunk as he crept stealthily along on my tracks not fifty yards away i was disgusted at his sleuth-hound persistence and crafty malignity i raised my gun to my shoulder and in another moment would have rid myself of his undesired attentions but the animal must have caught a gleam from the shining barrels for he turned like a flash and buried himself in the nearest thicket it was evident that he did not wish the matter forced to an immediate issue as a consequence i decided that it ought to be settled at once i ran toward the thicket but at the same time the panther stole out on the other side and disappeared in the woods upon this i concluded that he had become scared and given up his unhallowed purpose for some hours i dismissed him from my mind and tended my traps without further apprehension but about the middle of the afternoon or a little later when i had reached the farthest point on my circuit i once more became impressed with a sense that i was being followed the impression grew so strong that it weighed upon me and i determined to bring it to a test taking some luncheon from my pocket i sat down behind a tree to nibble and wait i suppose i must have sat there ten minutes hearing nothing seeing nothing so that i was about to give it up and continue my tramp when along came the panther my gun was levelled instantly but at that same instant the brute had disappeared his eyes were sharper than mine ah said i to myself i shall have to keep a big fire going to-night or this fellow will pay me a call when i am snoring oh surely not murmured queerman pensively the rest of us laughed but stranion only waved his pipe with a gesture that commanded silence and went on about sundown i met with an unlucky accident which dampened both my spirits and my powder in crossing a swift brook at a place where the ice was hardly thick enough to hold up its covering of snow i broke through and was soaked after fishing myself out with some difficulty i found my gun was full of water which had frozen as it entered 
here was a pretty fix the weapon was for the present utterly useless i feared that most of my cartridges were in light condition the prospect for the night when the indian devil should arrive upon the scene was not a cheerful one i pushed on miserably for another mile or so and then prepared to camp first of all i built such a fire as i thought would impress upon the indian devil a due sense of my importance and my mysterious powers at a safe distance from the fire i spread out my cartridges to dry in the fervent hope that the water had not penetrated far enough to render them useless my gun i put where it would thaw as quickly as possible then i cut enough firewood to blaze all night with my snowshoes i dug a deep hollow at one side of the fire the fire soon melted the snow beneath it and brought it down to the level whereon i was to place my couch i may say that the ground i had selected was a gentle slope and the fire was below my bed so that the melting snow could run off freely over my head i fixed a good firm lean-to of spruce saplings thickly thatched with boughs thus i secured myself in such a way that the indian devil could come at me only from the side on which the fire was burning such approach i congratulated myself would be little to his cat ship's taste by the time my shelter was completed it was full night in the woods my fire made a ruddy circle about the camp and presently i discerned the panther gliding in and out among the tree trunks on the outer edges of the circle he stared at me with his round green eyes and i returned the gaze with cold indifference i was busy putting my gun in order i would not encourage him lest he might grow too familiar before i was ready for his reception between my gleaming walls of snow i had worked up a temperature that was fairly tropical away up overhead among the pine tops a few large stars glimmered lonesomely how far away seemed the world of my friends on whom these same stars were looking down i wondered how those at home would feel if they could see me there by my solitary campfire watched relentlessly by that prowling and vindictive beast presently finding that i made no attack upon him the brute slipped noiselessly up to within a dozen paces of the fire there he crouched down in the snow and stared upon me i hurled a flaming brand at him and he sprang backward snarling into the gloom but the brand sputtered in the snow and went out whereupon the brute returned to his post then i threw another at him but he regarded it this time with contempt merely drawing aside to give it room when it had gone black out he approached pawed it over and sniffed in supremest contempt then he came much nearer so that i thought he was about to spring upon me i moved discreetly to the other side of the fire by this time the gun was ready for action but not so the cartridges they were lying farther from the fire and dangerously near my unwelcome visitor i perceived that i must make a diversion at once selecting a resinous stick into which the fire had eaten deeply so that it held a mass of glowing coals i launched it suddenly with such careful aim that it struck right between the brute's forelegs as it scorched there he caught and bit at it angrily dropped it with a screaming snarl and shrank farther away when he crouched down biting the snow i followed up my advantage by rushing upon him with a blazing roll of birch bark he did not await my onset but bounded off among the trees where i could hear him grumbling in the darkness over his smarting mouth i left the bark blazing in the snow while i went back to see to my precious cartridges before long the panther reappeared at the limits of the lighted circle but seemed not quite so confident as before nevertheless it was clear that he had set his heart on making a meal of me and was not to be bluffed out of his design by a few firebrands i discovered that all my ball cartridges were spoiled but there were a few loaded with shot which the water had not penetrated from these i withdrew the shot and substituted ball and slugs then slipping a ball cartridge into one barrel slugs into the other and three or four extra cartridges into a handy pocket i waited for my opponent to recover his confidence as he seemed content to wait a while i set about broiling my partridges for i was becoming clamorously hungry 
so also was the panther as it seemed when the odour of those partridges stole seductively to his nostrils he once more approached my fire and this time with an air of stern determination quite different from his former easy insolence the crisis had come i seized my gun and knelt down behind the fire i arranged a burning log in such a manner that i could grasp and wield it with both hands in an emergency just as the animal drew himself together for a spring i fired one barrel that containing the ball and shattered his lower jaw mad with pain and fury he sprang the contents of my second barrel a heavy charge of slugs met him full in the breast and he fell in a heap at my feet as he lay there struggling and snarling and tearing up the snow i slipped in another cartridge and the next moment a bullet in his brain put an end to his miseries after this performance i ate my partridges with a very grateful heart and slept the sleep of the just and the victorious the skin of that audacious indian devil lies now in my study where sam is continually desecrating it with his irreverent shoes good story stranion said magnus with grave approval the only thing hard to believe is that you should make two such good shots well you see i had to responded stranion and now let magnus give us a hot story to satisfy queerman i don't think i know another tropical yarn said magnus i'll give you one said sam and a bear story it is too it's about a scrape i got into when i was down in florida three years ago looking after uncle bill's oranges i'll call it an adventure in the florida hummocks i was boarding at a country house not far from the banks of the caloosahatchee river in a district full of game most of my time was spent in wandering with gun and dog through the luxuriant woods that clothed the hummocks and along the edges of the waving savannas or interval meadows the dog which always accompanied me was a large mongrel half setter and half newfoundland belonging to my landlord he was plucky and intelligent but untrained and i used to take him rather as a companion than as an assistant the soil in florida is generally very sandy but in the hummocks or as they are more usually called in florida hammocks the sand is mixed with clay and carries a heavy growth of timber the trees are chiefly dogwood pine magnolia and the several species of oak which grow in the south these hammocks vary in extent from one or two to a thousand or more acres and in many places the trees are so interlaced with rankly growing vines that one can penetrate the forest only by the narrow cattle paths leading to the water one afternoon i was threading a path which led through a particularly dense hummock to the bank of a wide shallow stream known as dogwood creek a branch of the caloosahatchee i carried a light double-barreled fowling piece and was seeking no game more formidable than wild turkeys my cartridges were loaded with number two shot but i had taken the precaution to drop a couple of ball cartridges in among the rest presently there was a heavy crashing amid the dense undergrowth on my right and bruce the dog who had dropped a few paces behind drew quickly up to my side with an angry growl the hair lifted along his back and between his ears as the crashing rapidly came nearer startlingly near in fact i made haste to remove my light cartridges and replace them with ball but alas to unload was one thing to find one of those two ball cartridges in the crowded depths of my capacious pocket was quite another every cartridge i brought to light was marked with exasperating plainness number two in my eager haste the perspiration stood out all over my face i knew well enough what was coming it was unquestionably a bear a panther would move more quietly and a stray steer would cause no such great concern to bruce whatever may have been my emotions surprise was certainly not among them when just as i had concluded that those two ball cartridges must have been a dream a huge bear which seemed very angry about something burst mightily forth into the pathway only three or four yards behind me it was not hard to decide what to do on either hand was the thicket to me practically impenetrable and behind was the bear straight ahead i ran at the top of my speed 
at the same time i managed to slip a couple of cartridges into my gun they were just whatever ones came to my hand but devoutly i hoped against hope that they might prove when tested to be those which were loaded with ball for perhaps two or three hundred yards the running was distinctly in my favor but then the pace began to tell on me at once i slackened speed and my pursuer closed in upon me so swiftly that i concluded to try a snap shot facing about with a sharp yell i expected the bear to rise on his hind legs and give me a fair chance for a shot but i had miscalculated my own momentum the bear indeed rose as i expected but at the same instant i tripped on a root and fell headlong the gun flew up in the air in a wonderful way and disappeared in the undergrowth to recover it was i knew impossible almost before i touched the ground i was on my feet again and running faster than ever but what refuge there was for me to run to i knew not and how the affair was going to end i dared not guess in the first burst of my renewed vigor and while the bear was recovering from his natural surprise at my extraordinary manoeuvre i had regained my lost ground all at once as my breath was about forsaking me the path opened before my eyes upon a grassy savanna beyond which shone the waters of dogwood creek at the water's edge was drawn up an old flatboat with a pole sticking out over the bow this craft was evidently used as a ferry to connect with the continuation of the path on the other side of the creek i darted forward thrust the punt off and flung myself into it an energetic push with the pole and the little craft shot out into the stream bruce meanwhile ran up along the water's edge barking furiously and the bear pursued him calling the dog to come to me i pushed the punt towards him with a frightened whine which i did not at the moment understand he plunged into the water and swam out bravely the bear hesitated a second or two and then dashed in after him raising a tremendous splash when bruce was within a couple of yards of the boat i was enlightened as to the cause of his reluctance to take the water an ugly black snout not unlike the butt of a water-logged timber was thrust into view close by then another a few feet below the desperately swimming animal then another and yet another till the sullen whitish surface of the creek was dotted thickly with the heads of alligators they had evidently been attracted by the sound of bruce's barking and i called to mind some stories i had heard at the house as to the abundance and ferocity of the alligators in dogwood creek a sturdy shove on the pole and i was at bruce's side reaching over i seized him by the scruff of the neck and jerked him into the boat just as a tremendous swirl in the water behind him showed where an alligator had made a rush for his legs the next instant the snout of the disappointed animal shot up beside the gunwale to receive a fierce jab from my pole which made it keep its distance by this time the bear was dangerously near at hand he was approaching with great wallowing plunges the water not being deep enough to compel him to swim i began to pole with all my might thinking that even yet i was far from being out of the difficulty with a few thrusts i put a safe distance between myself and my pursuer but the creek was not wide enough to enable me to gain any very great head start in this way in a most discontented frame of mind i had almost reached the landing when suddenly it occurred to me that really there was no necessity for me to land at once i could pole up and down the creek and dodge the bear until he should get tired and give up the chase with this purpose i thrust out again boldly into midstream the bear was now almost halfway across but those black snouts were closing about him ominously indeed the animal must have been blinded with rage or he would never have ventured into the deadly stream in a moment however it seemed to dawn upon him that he had got himself into trouble he stopped with an uneasy sort of whine then he turned and made for the shore as fast as he could but it was too late for him to escape in that way his path was blocked by several of the great reptiles whose appetites were now thoroughly aroused i thought to myself if that bear is game there's going to be a lively time around here just now and he was game 
true seeing that the odds were so overwhelmingly against him he had at first tried to avoid the combat but now that he was fairly in for it he acquitted himself in a way that soon won my sympathetic admiration and made me forget that but a moment before he had been thirsting for my own blood with a huge grunt of indignant defiance the bear hurled himself upon the nearest alligator on the massive armor of the reptile's back even his powerful claws made slight impression but with one paw he reached to the soft underside of the throat and the water was suddenly crimsoned as the alligator lashing the surface with his tail made off and took refuge in a bed of reeds at the same instant however the jaws of another assailant closed upon the animal's flank with a roar he rose straight up in the water shaking himself so mightily that his adversary's hold was broken then he threw his whole bulk on another which was advancing against him in front the alligator was borne under and disappeared probably forever hors de combat and the bear gained several yards toward safety then others crowded in upon him and his progress was stopped up to this time my sympathies had naturally been with the alligators to whom i owed my release from an embarrassing situation now however i felt myself going over to the side of the bear i hated to see the splendid though to me very objectionable brute thus at the mercy of a horde of ravening reptiles again shaking off his assailants the bear seemed merely bent on selling his life as dearly as possible rising on his hindquarters he faced toward the centre of the stream where his foes were most numerous what tremendous buffeting blows he dealt and how the strong knife-edged hooks of his claws searched out the unarmoured spots on his adversaries in my excitement i pushed perilously near and if i had had my lost gun i should certainly have taken a hand in the contest myself i would have given a good deal at that moment to be able to help the bear but the odds were too great for any strength or pluck to long contend against before many minutes the bear was dragged under and there was nothing to be seen but a heaving lashing foaming mass of alligators on the outskirts of the melee swam a few hungry reptiles who could not get into the division of the spoils these presently turned their attention to the boat purposing to console themselves with bruce and me awaking to the peril of the situation i began poling hurriedly toward the landing-place whence i had first started but almost instantly i was surrounded with alligators excited and enraged from their battle with the bear they were much more formidable than at ordinary times i had great reason to be thankful for the skill in poling which i had acquired in the birch-bark canoes of our northern rivers dodging some of my assailants i beat off others with the pole thrusting fiercely at their wicked little eyes which is the surest way to daunt them all at once there was a wild yelp from bruce and the punt reeled sharply the gunwale went under water and i was all but pitched out head first into the swarm of alligators my heart was in my mouth as with a swift and violent motion of the pole i recovered my balance and steadied the boat but with all my terror i had room for a pang of grief as i saw that poor bruce had been dragged overboard the capture of the dog however was probably my salvation the alligators which were in front of the boat darted into the scramble which was taking place over the new victim and i saw a clear space between me and the safety of the shore desperately i surged on the pole and the light craft shot in among the sedges as the prow lifted on to solid ground several of the long snouts rose over the stern snapping greedily but i had bounded forward like lightning and was beyond their reach in a second i paused not until i was clear of the savannah and among the timber throwing myself down on the reeking mould of the path i lay there till i had recovered my breath and a measure of my equanimity then after finding my gun in the depths of a mimosa thicket i wended my way homeward much depressed over the fate of bruce talking of dogs said queerman i'll tell you a story with a dog in it and it's got other things in it too a college story by way of a change come to think of it though we are all college men there has been very little in our stories to indicate the fact by all means kelly queerman said sam let's have the college story at once 
well to give it a proper scholastic flavor i will entitle it the junior latin scholarship end of chapter seven part one chapter seven of around the campfire by charles roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven the camp on the toledi part two the junior latin scholarship the sunshine of mid-may streamed alluringly into the great stone portico of the old college of x the wide-winged gray edifice stood on a high terrace just under the crest of the hill its ample windows looking down over the topmost boughs of ash and elm and maple over the roofs and spires of the little university town of x and out to the broad blue curve of the placid river on the steps lounged a group of students members of the senior and junior years several of the loiterers stood close to the open arched door and from time to time glanced expectantly into the hall a large black dog a cross between spitz and newfoundland lay in the centre of the hall assiduously licking at a small but angry wound on his leg at the farther end of the hall now appeared one of the professors he stepped in front of the notice-board and pinned a slip of white paper to the green baize-covered surface in a moment the portico was cleared and the men crowded in to read the announcement they did not rush noisily as freshmen or even sophomores might have done but their eagerness was tempered with dignity the seniors in particular were careful to be properly deliberate for announcements were expected by both classes and this might prove to be merely a junior list it was a junior list leaning on each other's shoulders the juniors clustered around the board while the seniors lingered on the outskirts and inquired with polite interest about the results they were mindful that these juniors would very soon be seniors and were therefore to be treated with a good deal of consideration then they dropped away in twos and threes while the juniors remained to take down the marks the marks which excited so much interest were those of the third terminal examination in latin a latin scholarship of the value of one hundred dollars was dependent on the results of three terminals compulsory for all the latin students of the junior class and on a special examination to be held at the very end of the term this examination was open only to those declaring themselves competitors for the scholarship it was generally expected throughout the college that the winner would be bert knollys who without effort had gained a slight lead in the first two terminals and whose ability in classics was unquestioned at the top of the present announcement stood knollys name with percentage of eighty six the second name on the list was of j s wright with eighty three to his credit wright's pulling up five more points will put him ahead was the remark of one man who had been figuring on his pad wright a sharp-featured sandy-haired fellow in the centre of the group nodded his approval of this calculation at the same moment a slim youth of barely middle height with laughing gray eyes and crisply waving hair ran up and peered eagerly through the throng of his comrades having deciphered his standing he was turning away as abruptly as he had come when some one said you'd better look out nollies wright is after you with a sharp stick i don't doubt jack can beat me if he tries responded nollies hold on a minute bert i want to talk with you a bit exclaimed a tall junior by the name of will allison extricating himself quickly from the crowd next hour old man cried nollies darting away i've got to catch dawson in the laboratory right off and can't wait a second allison who was nollie's most intimate friend crossed the hall and joined a senior who was lounging in a window overlooking the terrace it's my firm belief jones said he discontentedly that that cad jack wright is going to play bert false how so pray inquired the senior in a tone of very moderate interest why by going into the special exam of course replied allison and why shouldn't he as well as nollies go in to the special examination asked jones oh i thought every one knew about that exclaimed allison somewhat impatiently but it's this way since you inquire wright took the scholarship for our class last year the second year greek you know well nollies was way ahead on the average of the terminals and would have had a walk-over 
as every man in the class knows he can wipe out all the rest of us in classics without half trying but wright went to him and made a poor mouth about being so hard up that he'd have to leave college if he didn't get the scholarship bert has none too much cash himself but in his generous way he agreed not to go in for the special exam so wright of course got the scholarship in return he promised knowledge that he would not go in for the junior latin the following year this suited bert very well as he wanted to put his hard work on his readings for the science medal under these circumstances you see he has been taking it rather easy in the latin and i have reason to believe that wright has been working extra hard at it mark my words he'll go in at the last moment and catch bert napping but there's not another man in college that i would suspect of such a caddish trick well for my part said the senior i don't greatly care which gets it i grant you that wright's a cad but i'm disappointed in knowledge indeed poor knowledge murmured allison yes continued the senior loftily ignoring the sarcasm in my opinion knowledge funks it seems to me jones retorted allison you forget certain incidents that took place when bert knowledge was a freshman and you a sophomore oh said the senior calmly looking over allison's head the worm will turn but what i'm thinking about is his refusal to play football last fall he's quick and sharp and tough just the man the team wanted for quarterback if only he had the nerve said he was too busy to train indeed and jones sniffed contemptuously as he turned away to join some members of his own class leaving allison in a fume of indignation at this moment jack wright chancing to stroll past the big black dog gave the animal a careless kick the dog sprang at his assailant with a ferocious snarl much startled wright evaded the attack by dodging into a knot of his classmates and the dog lay down again growling angrily bran doesn't seem to be quite himself remarked a senior eyeing him narrowly he'd be an ugly customer to handle if he started to run amuck commented another senior chuckling at wright's discomfiture i wonder where he got that bite on his leg this was something which nobody knew and the incident was promptly forgotten by all but jack wright who thenceforth gave the animal a wide berth as soon as knowledge came out of the laboratory will allison told him his suspicions in regard to wright and urged him to put his energies upon the latin but knowledge was always slow to believe that a comrade could be guilty of treachery i don't think wright is really such a bad lot old man said he only his manner is unfortunate and he isn't popular just three days later appeared on the notice board the announcement that b knowledge and j s wright were competitors for the junior latin scholarship the examination was to take place on the following morning bert knowledge was hurt and indignant his friends were furious and wright looked craftily triumphant over the prospect of so neatly getting ahead of a rival knowledge was by no means prepared for such a contest as he knew wright was capable of giving him but his anger nerved him to the utmost effort returning in hot haste to his home in the outskirts of town he shut himself into his little study all through the afternoon he toiled mightily over book and lexicon about tea-time he took a short walk and then settled down for a night of solid grind he was bound that he would win if it was in him toward two o'clock however eyes and brain alike grew dim and the meaning began to mix themselves most vexatiously he sprang up snatched his cap let himself out of the house noiselessly and set forth to wake his wits by a brisk run for the sake of the freer air he took a path traversing the hilltop toward the college the path ran through the open pastures and reached at length a rocky ridge just back of the cottage of dr adams the professor of classics here jack wright was boarding as nolly swung past along the ridge he glanced downward to the professor's study window and as he did so a light appeared therein he halted instinctively and the next moment his lip was curling with astonished contempt as he saw jack wright seat himself before the study table and stealthily search the drawers the top of the ridge was so near the window that knollys where he leaned against the fence could see all that went on as if he had been in the room 
at last after going through almost every drawer with frequent guilty listening pauses wright found what he wanted an examination paper after making a hurried copy of it he returned it to its place and then with his lamp turned very low he stole out of the room bert nolly's first thought was to go at once to dr adams lay his complaint and have wright's room searched before he could have time to destroy the stolen copy then it occurred to him that this would lead inevitably to wright's expulsion and not improbably to his ruin he therefore dismissed the idea he hastened back home tried to study but found the effort vain went to bed and fell asleep without having arrived at any solution of the problem in the morning he was equally undecided perhaps his best course would have been to go to the professor declare a suspicion that the paper had been tampered with and ask that a new paper be set but he failed to think of this way out of the difficulty and at last tired of worrying over it he made up his mind to do nothing he went into the examination wrote an unusually good paper and came out feeling that there was yet a chance for him in spite of wright's previous knowledge of the questions but on the day following was posted the announcement that wright was the winner by a lead of three marks on the average for the four examinations the affair was a grievous disappointment to bert nollies and meant the upsetting of all his plans for the summer he had counted on the scholarship money to enable him to take a long vacation trip with will allison this scheme he had now to abandon and allison could not refrain from reproaching him for his misplaced confidence in jack wright furthermore he was accused of petty jealousy by many students outside of his own class and his popularity undermined by wright's skilful insinuations rapidly dwindled away smarting under the injustice and seeing no satisfactory way to remove the misunderstanding knowledge grew moody and depressed the days slipped by quickly and commencement was close at hand one warm afternoon a number of the students were in the baseball field where a practice match was in progress the college nine was strenuously preparing for the great commencement day match nollies allison jones and a few others were lying under the fence on the farther side of the field while most of the spectators were grouped as close as possible to the players jack wright was at the bat suddenly in the gate of the college barnyard above the ball field appeared bran the dog the hair lifted along his backbone and on his neck and a light froth showed about his half bared teeth he was a sinister and menacing figure as he stood there a strange trouble in his wild red eyes after glaring uneasily from side to side for several minutes he gave utterance to a yelping snarl and darted down the hillside toward the field the group under the fence observed him at once what's the matter with the dog exclaimed jones in a tone of apprehension and look at bran shouted someone else the pitcher stopped in the very act of delivering the ball and every eye went in the one direction the dread truth was evident at once on all sides arose the appalling cry he's mad mad dog mad dog and players and spectators scattered in sickening panic as it were in the twinkling of an eye the field was empty but no it was not quite empty turning in wild terror and starting to run as he turned jack wright tripped fell and snapped his ankle he got up and saw himself alone in the wide sunny field the dog had just entered the gate and was making straight for him with foaming snapping jaws he strove to flee but the shattered ankle gave way beneath him and with a piercing cry of horror he dropped in a heap burying his face in his hands nollies like all the rest had sprung over the fence at the first alarm but at that despairing cry he sprang back again there was no hesitation no waiting to see what the others would do swift as a deer he sped out across the shining and deadly expanse as he ran he stooped to snatch up a bat which lay in his path it was a question which would win in the awful race and the crowd of fugitives checking their flight watched in spellbound silence the dog arrived first but only by a foot or two as it sprang at wright's prostrate body nollies reached out with a fierce lunge and caught it between the jaws with the end of the bat 
biting madly at the wood the animal rose on its hind legs and in a flash knowledge had both hands clenched in a grip of steel about its throat for a few seconds the struggle was a desperate one the animal's strength was great and knowledge had all he could do to hold him at arm's length then will allison arrived panting and conscience-stricken for his tardiness he was followed by two or three others who had broken the spell of their panic a couple of well-directed blows from the bat in allison's hands stunned the dog and it was then speedily dispatched breathing somewhat quickly but otherwise quite cool knollys looked down upon jack wright's ghastly face glad i was in time wright said he bert cried wright in a shaking voice you won that scholarship i just cribbed the whole paper to thank his rescuer he felt was not within the power of words but reparation was in part possible and his one thought was to make it we won't talk of that now answered knollys i know all about it jack i saw the whole thing and we just won't say anything more about it old fellow but wright had fainted from the pain and the shock and did not hear the forgiveness in bert's voice the next day a letter went from wright's sick bed to the president of the college wright wanted to tell everything but on bert's advice he merely confessed that he had cribbed without saying how and resigned his claim to the scholarship at commencement therefore it was announced by the president that the latin scholarship had been won by b knollys many conflicting rumors of course went abroad among the students but to no one except will allison was the whole truth told as for wright a new point of view seemed all at once to have opened before his eyes the loftier standard which he now learned to set himself he adhered to throughout the rest of his course and then carried forth with him into what have proved very creditable and successful relations with the world queerman has grown didactic said i that is surely not the tone for a canoe trip ranolph it's your turn to take the platform let us have something that is simple unmedicated adventure i'll tell you a bicycle story said ranolph an unromantic tale of a romantic land it is all about a bull and a bicycle in the land of evangeline a bull and a bicycle it was in the autumn of eighteen eighty nine while the old high wheels were still in use that i rode through the evangeline land with a fellow wheelman from halifax we rolled lazily along a well-kept road and sang the praises of nova scotia's scenery and air ahead of us across a wide flashing water the storied expanse of minas towered the blue-black bastion of cape blomidon capped with rolling vapours to our left and behind us rose fair rounded hills some thickly wooded others with orchards and meadows on their slopes while to our right lay far unrolled those rich diked lands which the vanished acadian farmers of old won back from the sea though another race now held these lovely regions we felt that the landscape through whatever vicissitudes must lie changelessly under the spell of one enchantment the touch of the well-loved poet we felt that something more than mere beauty of scene however wonderful was needed to explain the exalted mood which had taken possession of two hungry wheelmen like ourselves and we acknowledged that additional something in the romance of history and song presently we came to a stretch of road which had been treated to a generous top dressing of loose sand such ignorance of the principles of good road-making soon brought us down both from our lofty mood and from our labouring wheels we trudged toilsomely for nearly half a mile saying unkind things now of the nova scotian road-makers and quite forgetting the melodious sorrows of the acadian exiles then we came to the village of avonport and were much solaced by the sight of the village inn in the porch of the unpretentious hostelry we found a fellow cycler in a sorely battered condition several strips of court plaster black and pink distributed artistically about his forehead nose and chin gave a mightily grotesque appearance to his otherwise melancholy countenance one of his stockings was rolled down about his ankle and he was busy applying arnica to a badly bruised chin against the bench on which he was sitting leaned a bicycle which looked as if it had been in collision with an earthquake the poor fellow's woe-begone countenance brightened up as we entered and we made ourselves acquainted 
he was a solitary tourist from eastport maine and a principal in the important case of bull vs bicycle which had just decided very much in favour of bull we dined together and as our appetites diminished our curiosity increased presently caldwell as the woebegone cyclist called himself detailed to us his misadventure as follows it wasn't more than an hour before you fellows came that i got here myself i was in a nice mess i can tell you but plenty of cold water and mrs briggs arnica and court plaster have pulled me together a lot i only hope we can do as much after dinner for that poor old wheel of mine this morning i had a fine trip pretty nearly all the way from windsor splendid weather wasn't it and a good hard road most of the way eh? you remember that long smooth hill about two miles back from here and the road that crosses it at the foot nearly at right angles well as i came coasting down that hill happy as a clam my feet over the handles i almost ran into a party of men with ropes and a gun moving along that crossroad i stopped for a little talk with them and asked what they were up to it appeared that a very dangerous bull had got loose from a farm up the river and had taken to the road they were afraid it would gore somebody before they could recapture it i asked them if they knew which way it had gone and they told me the critter was sure to make right for the dyke lands where it used to pasture in its earlier and more amiable days that cross-road was the way to the dykes and they pursued it confidently i took it into my head that it would be a lark to go along with them and see the capture of the obstreperous animal but the men who were intelligent fellows and knew what they were talking about told me i should find the road too heavy and rough for my wheel rather reluctantly i bade them good morning and continued my journey by the highway now as a fact that bull had no notion of going to the dykes he had turned off the cross-road and sauntered along the highway just where he could get most fun and see the most of life but i'll venture to say he hadn't counted on meeting a bicycle i hadn't gone more than half a mile or perhaps less when a little distance ahead of me i noticed some cattle feeding by the roadside i thought nothing of that of course but presently one of the cattle a tremendous animal almost pure white stepped into the middle of the road and began to paw the mud certain anxious questionings arose within me then the animal put his great head to the earth and uttered a mighty bellow with much perturbation of spirit i concluded that the angry bull had not betaken himself to the dykes after all i felt very bitter toward those men for this mistake and for not having suffered me to go along with them in their futile errand they wanted the bull and wouldn't find him i on the other hand had found him and i didn't want him at all i checked my course pedaling very slowly uncertain what to do the bull stood watching me if i turned and made tracks he would catch me on the hill or on the soft crossroad if i took to the woods there was little to gain for there were no fences behind which to take refuge and if i should climb a tree i knew the beast would demolish my wheel straight ahead however as far as i could see the road was level and good and in the distance i saw farms and fences i decided to keep right on the road along there is wide and hard as you know and bordered with a deep ditch i put on good speed and the bull as he saw me approaching looked a little puzzled he took the wheel and me i presume for some unheard-of monster i guessed his meditations and concluded he was getting frightened but there i was mistaken he was only getting in a rage he suddenly concluded that it was his mission to rid the world of monsters and with a roar he charged down to meet me now thought i for a trick and then a race in which i'll show a pretty speedy pair of heels i rode straight at the bull who must have had strange misgivings though he never flinched at the last possible moment i swerved sharply aside and swept past the baffled animal in a fine triumphant curve before he could stop himself and turn i was away down the road at a pace that i knew would try his mettle but the brute had a most pernicious energy he came thundering and pounding along my track at a rate that kept me quite busy i stayed ahead easily enough but i did not do much more than that for fear of getting winded there's where i made the mistake i think 
i ought to have done my utmost in order to discourage and distance my pursuer i didn't allow for contingencies ahead but just pedalled along gaily and enjoyed the situation of course i kept a sharp lookout in order that i shouldn't take a header over a stone but i felt myself master of the situation at last and in an evil hour i came to where they had been mending the road with all that abominable sand let us pass over my feelings at this point they were indescribable my wheel almost came to a standstill then i called up fresh energies and bent forward and strained to the task i went ahead but it was like wading through a feather bed and the bull began to draw nearer a little in front the fences began the first was a high board fence with a gate in it and a hay road leading by a rough bridge into the highway my whole effort now was to make that gate the perspiration was rolling down my face half blinding me my mighty pursuer was getting closer and closer and i was feeling pretty well pumped it was as much as a bargain which would win the race i dared not look behind but my anxious ears kept me all too well informed i reached the bridge and darted across it immediately i heard my pursuer's feet upon it i had no time to dismount i rode straight at the gate ran upon it and shot over it head first in a magnificent header landing in a heap of stones and brambles in a glow of triumph which at first prevented me feeling my wounds i picked myself up and beheld the furious beast in the act of trying to gore my unoffending bicycle at first he had stopped in consternation naturally amazed at seeing the monster divided into two parts the portion which had shot over the gate he perceived to be very like a man but the other part remained all the more mysterious presently he plunged his horns tentatively into the big wheel whereupon my brave bicycle reared and struck him in the eye with a handle and set the little wheel crawling up his back at this the bull was astonished and alarmed so much so that he backed off a little way then seeing that the bicycle lay motionless on the ground he charged upon it again maltreating it shamefully and tossing it up on his horns this was too much for me i ran up reached over the gate and laid hold of my precious wheel by strange good fortune i succeeded in detaching it from the brute's horns and hauling it over the gate then i pelted the animal with sticks and stones till he got disgusted and moved away as soon as he was safely off the scene i opened the gate and limped sorrowfully down to this place dragging my wheel by my side do you think we can do anything with it the first thing necessary said i is to have an examination and make a diagnosis of its injuries this we forthwith proceeded to do and found the matter pretty serious after spending an hour in tinkering at the machine we had to give up the job then we set forth on a visit to the village blacksmith who after being regaled with a full account of caldwell's misadventure addressed himself to his task with vast good will he was a skilful man and before nightfall the wheel was in better travelling shape than its unlucky owner but caldwell was good stuff and of a merry heart so that when on the following day he became our travelling companion we found that his scars and his lugubrious countenance only heightened the effect of his good fellowship i think said i that after a cheerful narrative like ranald's you can stand a somewhat bloody one from me all right o m answered queerman pile on as much gore as you like don't expect too much said i it's only another wolf story the name thereof is the den of the gray wolf not long ago i was doing the tobique with joe maxim an old hunter whom i think none of you have met we were dropping smoothly down with the current approaching the narrows maxim was a curious and interesting character of good old colonial stock and equipped in youth with an excellent education he had found himself in early manhood at odds with society and the requirements of civilized life perhaps through some remote ancestor there had crept into his veins a streak of indian or other wandering blood at any rate the wilderness had drawn him with a spell that overcame all counter attractions he drifted to the remotest backwoods and there devoted himself to hunting and trapping 
never entering the settlements except to purchase supplies or sell his furs he had spent the best years of his life in an almost unbroken solitude yet the few sportsmen who penetrated to his haunts and sought his skilful services found that seclusion had failed to make him morose he was kindly and not uncompanionable and though in appearance one of the roughest of his adopted class he preserved to a marked degree the speech and accent of his earlier days you were speaking just now said he of the wolves coming back to new brunswick well they're here off and on most of the time i reckon it was not far from here that i had a scrimmage with them about twenty years back at this point a murmurous roaring began to make itself heard on the still air and before i could ask any more questions about the wolves maxim exclaimed we can't go through the narrows to-night not light enough with this head of water better camp right here agreed said i and we slid gently up along the side of a projecting log presently we had the tent pitched on a bit of dry soft sward that sloped ever so little toward the water side behind the tent was a thicket of spruce that sheltered us from the night wind and in front laughed softly the river as it hurried along its shining trail beneath the full moon to bury itself in the chasms of the dark hill range which separated it from its sovereign the wide st john after supper when the campfire was blazing cheerfully maxim told me about the wolves well said he in a reminiscent tone it was in those hills yonder very near the narrows i struck the wolves i knew there were a good many of them round that winter as i'd come across lots of their tracks there was a bounty then of fifteen dollars on a wolf's snout that was twenty years ago and i was keeping my eyes pretty well peeled my lookout was all in vain however till along one afternoon i caught sight of one of the skulking vermin dodging behind some bushes not far from here but on the other side of the river it was only a snapshot i got at the beast but i wounded it and you better believe i lost no time following up the trail by the way he bled i could see that he was hard hit he led me away up nigh the top of the mountain then took a sharp turn to the river and pretty soon i came out onto a little level place a sort of high platform in front of a big bare slope of rock in the foot of that rock there was a hole just about big enough for a man to crawl into on his hands and knees and into that hole led the trail of my wolf got him fast enough said i to myself but how to get at him there's the rub as i stood there considering another wolf slid by me like a long gray shadow and sneaked into the den without putting the gun to my shoulder i gave him a shot which fetched him in the hindquarters just as he disappeared that's good for thirty dollars said i to myself loading up again and hoping some more would come along they didn't come so pretty soon i gave them up and went and examined the hole i could see that it narrowed down rapidly and i hardly knew what to do i wanted that thirty dollars but i didn't want to crawl into that little dark hole after it with maybe a couple of yet lively wolves waiting at the other end to receive me why didn't you leave them there and go back for them next day by that time if they were really hard hit you'd have found them dead enough was my comment there wouldn't have been much of them left for me by the morrow said maxim i knew well enough the other wolves would scent the blood and come along and help themselves to snouts and all in the night so by and by i made up my mind to crawl in and risk it standing my gun up against the rock and taking my knife in my right hand i started in ah said i it makes me shiver to think of it it was nasty assented maxim but then i counted on one of the vermin at least being dead and i didn't think there'd be much fight left in the other but that hole narrowed down mighty sudden and the first thing i knew i had to crawl flat on my stomach to get along at all and presently i found it tight squeezing even that way of course i held my right hand with a knife in it well to the front ready to protect my head and face just as the hole got so tight for me that i was about concluding to give up the job i heard a terrific snarl right in my ear and a wolf jumped on to me his fangs got me right in the jaw you can see the scars here now and i thought i was about fixed 
but i slashed out desperately with my big knife and caught my assailant somewhere with a deadly thrust he yelped and sprang out of the way i felt the blood streaming over my face and knew i was badly bitten i'd had enough of that enterprise but when i tried to back out the way i had come i found i couldn't work it when it dawned upon me that i was stuck in that trap a cold sweat broke out all over me i was stuck and no mistake then i wriggled a little farther in and at this the wolf was on to me again this time my face escaped and his fangs went into my shoulder but the next moment my knife edge found his throat and down he came in a heap then i lay still a bit to get my breath and consider the situation the one thing clear was that i had got myself into a tight place and i began to wriggle for all i was worth in order to get out of it after twisting and tugging and straining for perhaps ten solid minutes i was forced to acknowledge to myself that i had not gained one inch then i made up my mind that my only hope lay in squeezing myself all the way in once inside the cave i thought it would be comparatively easy work to wriggle out head first in this direction i gained a few inches perhaps a foot or more and by this time i felt so exhausted that i wanted to lie still and take a sleep which i knew of course would be madness intending to rest but a moment i must nevertheless have fallen into a doze how long i lay there i don't know but it must have been getting well along past sundown when i was awakened by a sound that brought my heart into my throat and made every hair stand on end it was the howl of a wolf outside i interrupted the story at this point with an involuntary ah yes said maxim acknowledging my sympathy i could face any number of the vermin and not lose hold of myself but the idea of them coming along behind and eating me gradually feet first was too much i think that for a moment or two i must have been clean crazy at any rate i found strength enough in that minute or two to force my way right on and into the cave without knowing how i did it and i found afterwards that the struggle had peeled off not only most of my clothes but lots of the flesh on my hips and shoulders as well as soon as i realized that i was inside the den i felt around for the two dead wolves and stuffed them head first into the hole i had just come through they filled it pretty snugly and then i seated myself on their hind legs to hold them solid and hunted for a match in the rags of my clothes i had a pocket left and fortunately there were some matches in it lighting one i perceived in the sudden flare that i was in a little cave about four feet high and maybe seven or eight feet square the floor of it was dry sand and there were bones lying about presently in the tunnel behind me sounded a snarl that seemed to come right against my backbone and i jumped about a foot then i grabbed hold of the dead wolves and hung on to them for all i was worth for i could feel something dragging at one of them you see my experience in the hole had shaken my nerves pretty badly if i'd been just myself i should have cleared the way and let my assailants in killing them one by one with my knife as they crawled through as it was however i gave a yell that scared the brood in the tunnel so that he backed out in a hurry and then i heard two or three of them howling outside but it encouraged me a good deal to see what an effect my voice produced pretty soon one of the wolves crept back sniffing sniffing into the hole and as soon as he discovered that it was only dead wolves that were stopping the way he began to gnaw it was a sickening sound he made gnawing that way after standing it as long as i could i put my face down between the bodies and gave another yell how it echoed in that little place and how quick that wolf backed out again for all the misery and anxiety i was in i couldn't help laughing to myself there in the dark wondering what the brute would think it was i tried this game on half a dozen times very successfully but after that the wolves ceased to mind it one would come and gnaw for a while then another would give him a nip in the rear squeeze past and take his place i soon began to fear my unique barricade would be all eaten away before morning and i cast about in my mind for some other means of diverting the hungry animal's attention 
at length a brilliant idea struck me i lit a match and thrust it into the hole right under the cannibals noses that gave them a big surprise i can tell you they backed out in a great hurry and sniffed about and howled a good deal before they ventured in again as long as those matches held out i had no trouble and the wolves just kept howling outside the hole not daring to come in after their victuals while there were still such mysterious goings on within the cave by and by however like all good things the matches came to an end then presently in came the wolves and soon they were gnawing away harder than ever i was thinking that before long i would have to fight it out with the crowd after all and then it occurred to me that i might as well begin right off lying flat down i thrust my right hand with the knife in it blade up as far as i could reach out into the hole but underneath the dead wolves then i gave two or three tremendous sweeping slashes one of the brutes must have caught it pretty stiff he yelped and snarled hideously and got outside for all he was worth then for a minute or two the whole lot howled and yelped in chorus they must have been discussing the various mysteries of the cave and concluded that these were too dangerous to be explored any further for presently all was silent and by an occasional yelp in the distance i knew that the animals had betaken themselves elsewhere i know it was a crazy thing to do but just as soon as i made up my mind the wolves were gone i dropped to sleep right across the entrance of the den when i awoke i was so still and my wounds pained so that i could hardly move but i knew i had to brace up and get out of that before another night should come i pulled away the bodies and saw it was broad daylight i took my knife and chipped away for a long while at the walls and roof of the tunnel finding the rock very soft and crumbly then i crawled out with pain and difficulty and pointed straight for the settlements where i arrived more dead than alive but i managed to lug along with me what there was left of those wolf snouts together with the tails and i got the thirty dollars after all as maxim finished his story the roar of the narrows long unheeded fell again upon my ear with a distinctness almost startling and a loon cried mockingly from a hidden lakelet maxim rose and replenished the sinking fire then we rolled ourselves into our blankets as i propose that we all do now agreed cried several voices at once and very soon the camp on the Toledi was sunk in slumber End of chapter 7, part 2